This episode is brought to you by Modal Electronics, who enable you to play and perform powerful sound with their incredible synthesizers. You can enjoy vibrant wavetable patches with the Argon 8 series, or you can produce with state-of-the-art analog style synth textures with the Cobalt 8 series. To check out Modal Electronics' incredible array of synthesizers, go to modalelectronics.com. Modal Electronics, dare to sound different. How big a role does music play in your life? Well, I think music's always played a big role in my life. And I think that um, a d different sorts of music for different uh, occasions and different phases of life. I mean, uh, originally, originally I thought we were going to play the music, as you know, but um, I gather we're not. So I sort of tried to get a balance of different things. And so um, in the ch choices that I had, I chose to begin with um, a William Harrell Harris choral anthem because I've always spent a, a lot of my time at St George's Chapel, Windsor. He was the organist there. And it's a particularly amazing anthem because it's, it's one that the choir can hardly ever sing. They have to be really kind of uh, at that, you know, that extraordinary moment just before their voices break and they've been really trained and things just before they go on. You know, because uh, you can't just do it on the first day of term. It's really complicated. And it's a lovely, lovely anthem called King of Glory. That was the first one I chose to represent that side of my life, really. And then during lockdown, I mean, I've been one of the lucky people um, because I work at home and, and very often in this room. And so I found I tried all sorts of different operas, but I always come back to Traviata somehow. I find that very invigorating and it's got some it's very easy, of course, as a Verdi. Um, I would recommend it to anyone starting out on opera who's a bit scared of it. And of course, it's a great tragic love story. And um, so I love I love that. And I, every time I put it on, I just, you know, the hours go by and I'm happily typing away. So um, those were the sort of classical ones. And then, of course, I think that really my generation has been terribly lucky because, you know, when we are put away into a maximum security twilight home, um, <laughs> they won't be playing sort of um, Vera Lynn songs from the Second World War. They'll be playing the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and all their those wonderful things of, that came along in my youth. And uh, I selected, therefore, two of those. One, because, you know, let's face it, uh, from time to time when we're young, we all get depressed. And there's, the best remedy for being depressed is to put on a Leonard Cohen record, you know, and then you just mm -hmm. go really deep down in. You know, he, he used to always say that a, a razor blade should be sold with his, with his records, you know. But, of course, uh, he was also very inspiring. Um, I love that particular song, So Long, Marianne, and the Field Commander Tour version of it has got the most incredible percussion in it. But I'm sure you know the story with, um, with it was inspired by Marianne, you know, his Norwegian girlfriend at the time. And then one day, you know, on his later tours, he, he went to Oslo and he was performing. And um, she went along and bought a ticket and didn't want to kind of like say that she was there and she was sitting in the audience and she by that stage was probably a little old lady you know 70 something and um she said you know that she didn't want to go and see him or anything but she said i just kind of felt that he knew that i was there and can you imagine what that must have been like to hear That's this song so incredible played by by so many people and i saw leonard cohen five times live which was fantastic one way back in 1974 in the albert hall um and then of course, as you know, he lost all his money and he had to come back and do, do more, more tours. And so I saw him four times quite recently. Fantastic. I took my son once, actually, when he was very young. And you can always tell whether children like it or not, because they, you know, they can be polite, but they can be enthusiastic, too. And of course, Hallelujah, mm. they all knew because of Shrek. You know? Yeah, yeah. So, so long, Mary. Number of, is yeah. a number of covers of that. Um, but yeah, that's yeah. such an incredible story. And did 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 she publish? Did she do an interview, or did she publish something? Yeah, there's a film that's been done recently of of the story of the two of them, and uh, and yes, and she she appears because you know that just before just before she died, she she, she a friend of hers reached out to him and he sent a message, and uh, and then he basically, I wish I could quote it to you directly, said you know sort of uh, how much he always loved her and that he would be following her soon, and I mean all too soon. He left us, you know, which was, was 2016, I remember. It's one of those yeah. awful times when I knew where I was at exactly the moment I saw it 
coming along the ticker tape on Sky News or something awful, you know. But he was a great, mm. he was a great person. Towards the end, I think he was sort of in on the joke, you know. He kind of like he knew that he was, he was sort of um, his his messages of gloom and doom and things, you know, were sort of like almost it's almost almost funny sometimes to be honest, mm. you know. And he, he would come prancing onto the stage with his sort of with his grey hat, you know. And, and one 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 of the one of the times in one of the concerts where he has a line sort of I've tried to leave you many times before and the whole audience goes wow you know <laughs> <laughs> they love it they said in the program notes he was like like Moses coming down from the mountain you know it's great actually yeah he was extraordinary artist yes and then of course uh, I mean, there were many other things that I could have chosen but I did, did think that Paul's Simon's uh, Simon and Garfunkel, The Sound of Silence, is particularly a, a lovely, a lovely piece of music. And of course, you know, The Graduate um, was such an iconic film too, which came out in the sixties. I remember seeing it then, and I've seen it several times since. You can really watch that film with great enjoyment. And, and what an uplifting thing it was to have Simon and Garfunkel's music. And wasn't it dreadful that they couldn't stick together? Those two, they were they were so good. But Paul Simon mm. came to Hyde Park in London, uh, two thousand and eighteen. And, and I took my daughter Alice along and we were there in the park surrounded by people. And then gradually the sun went down. He played a lot of his new songs, which I must say I didn't know, obviously, if I didn't know them at all, frankly. But just towards the end, just as we went, just as we were about to go home, came the sound of silence. And it was kind of like floating around in my head as I went back. It was wonderful. Yeah, that is such a beautiful piece of music. And I mean, were, were you not a fan of Paul Simon solo? Were you a bigger fan of uh, Simon Garfunkel? I'm a fan of both of them together both. and solo. <laughs> both of yeah, them, you for know, sure. Uh, absolutely. No, I just, I just think it was sad that they couldn't stick together because we. It's very selfish, but we needed them together, you know. But he's good on his own too. He was very good. It's interesting that you mention uh, Simon and Garfunkel and Verdi, uh, because uh, in terms of opera. When when I first w went to Italy and my parents tried taking me to, I think it's called Torre del Lago. Uh, in in Tuscany, which is a beautiful place to go and see opera, but age seven or eight, I didn't really appreciate it too much. But we always had Simon and Garfunkel on in the car, and I do remember uh, just falling in love with with that music. And and of course yeah. now, uh, going to an opera like that would be great. Although you know, I'm not, I'd make no pretense to be too knowledgeable um, about opera, despite the tongue in cheek name of the greatest music of all time. Uh, I mean, I guess you know, it's. Uh, Stuff, we, we do feature a lot of artists like Paul Simon, though. We've had, um, we haven't had Paul Simon himself, but people of his era and generation, we have a lot on the show. Um, yes, of course you do. Yes, absolutely. Um, but of course, I think the thing, the thing, the reason I, I think I took to opera particularly because when I was working in London, there was a guy in the flat below and he kept playing pop music. And I thought, well, I've got to, I put on Radio 3 and I recorded um, Traviata and I recorded Otello as well. That That's another lovely one. And I, and, and um, once um, discovered it was on at um, Covent Garden and um, I hadn't got a ticket but I kind of went outside the opera house and hung around mm. for a few minutes and guess what somebody came up and sold me one and I was all on my own and I didn't have to worry about anybody else enjoying themselves I didn't have to take anybody out to dinner afterwards or worry about my car being on a yellow line mm. or anything and I really loved that that was the best evening terribly selfish but I think you, you need to go into it don't you gradually I think that's yeah, the for thing. sure. I've been to I've been to Glyndebourne before and uh, struggled through. I, it was nine hours of Wagner. Uh, I do. I preferred my experiences in Tuscany. Uh, I did. Yeah. I, I do. I mean, it is extraordinary. It was extraordinary going to see the Wagner, but it was too. It was too heavy and involved uh, for my first uh, yeah, adult experience. I'm trying to. I'm trying to listen to a bit of Wagner to get into it. And I did sing, sing in Tannhäuser when I was at school, which is, which is a very nice one, a nice chorus. You know, we, we used to do those choral things uh, at school when I was like 16, 17, 18. That was great fun. And, and this, and I've got one more I've got, which actually mm. is a song which hasn't been released yet, which is by a girl called um, Diana Rosalind, or sometimes known as Diana Trimble. And, and it's a recording, it's called Whisper Wind. And I, I don't know how I can kind of like, maybe I can put this up on my social media afterwards or perhaps a link to it or something. Because I'll, I I'll that... link to it in the show notes as well. Oh, will um, you? That, that's yes. great. You, you can get it if you Google it. But sad, very sadly, she died in January, far too young. And it's the most, you know, the sort of music I like, because I've explained, you know, it's kind of, it's very much in that genre. It's haunting, it's poetic. 
and she's got the most lovely voice and she should really be better known. And it's, it's terribly sad that she, she died out in New Orleans and her sister is trying to do a kind of like a GoFundMe to try and rescue her, you know, her, her musical legacy because we don't know what's out there still, what, what's, what's still in her apartment. You know, it's kind of one of those terribly, terribly sad um, things. I, did, I never knew Diana, but I, I've met the sister, you know, so, and that really, I, I've listened, I just keep putting that on. I've listened to that about 10 or 12 times, you know, very, very yeah, recently. I thought it was beautiful, but and how, how old was she? She was in her 50s and she'd done a number of different things. And um, she was, you know, she was, she read poetry and, and uh, all, all sorts of things. Uh, she was also kind of a bit of an activist, I think. And, and she, I think, went through different genres of music. But this is the one I really love. I can't, I can't, can't help saying it's the most extraordinary voice. And anyway, I just thought I'd like to mention it. You know, it's, it's very good to mention people uh, who perhaps don't get an, uh, enough credit. And, you know, hopefully uh, highlighting them in, in the podcast can uh, be a small part in yeah. uh, making, sure. making her yeah. legacy better, better known. Yes. Yes. Well, I think as long as it can be collected together, you know, and, and uh, something can be done with it would be fantastic. You know, but anyway, that's that's just it's just a very, very beautiful one. So when I when I had this opportunity, I thought, yeah, I'm going to mention that one. Yeah. And you, you mentioned in your email uh, that you had found lockdown in some respects, you know, quite a joy, um, you know, the actual experience of being in, in, in lockdown. Uh, so how did, big a part did music play in that? And, and why did you find lockdown, you know, to be a joy? Well, of course, the, 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 one of the joys of lockdown was having the time to listen to the music. You know, I, I am subscribed to a, one of those channels and I could choose anything. And while I'm working, I can listen to music at the same time. Now, I have to make a confession to you. I'm one of the few people that you will ever meet who can earn an honest living in bed. <laughs> I am a writer and I have a laptop and I very often work in bed. Some people do that, you know, but actually I'm... I, I was mainly living in London. I have a, an apartment in London uh, with my son, the, the, the son, the, another son that I haven't mentioned yet. Um, uh, I mentioned the, I took Arthur to Leonard Cohen. I took Alice to Paul Simon, but the other son, George, was living with me in London. And we were kind of like, oh, it's not going to get us this pandemic. We're just going to go around it quite normally. And then actually suddenly decided, like the Russians leaving Moscow before Napoleon swung in in 1812, that it was time to go. And I'm very lucky to have this house in the country in Wiltshire, which is right in the middle of Salisbury Plain. So my children are out of school. I work at home. I've got a, a large garden. I've got a nice house. I've got all my books around me. Um, the spring we had in London and in England was beautiful last year, really, really beautiful. So I've had a chance to see every bud opening. And I'm right in the middle of Salisbury Plain, which I could work, walk for miles and miles and miles without seeing anybody. So, you know, I really can't complain. In fact, I've done more work in lockdown than I've, done for, for ages and I've I've given them um, in the last few few weeks I've given a lecture in Toronto one in Palm Beach one in New York one in San Francisco and one in Connecticut all from this this chair basically wow, wow. yeah and they have no traveling you see and and then next door to me is a pub with a Michelin star and they started doing takeaways so listen I can't complain I've had wow, a yeah I mean, also, it's, it's good to hear people making you know making the best of it uh, and and but not only that, but it's not even making the best of it. It just sounds very very pleasant. Well, the thing is that I mean, listen, I know a lot of people have had an absolutely horrible time, but fundamentally, what the government asked me to do at my age was just to keep out of the way, and so I was happy to do that. And I think it's been an opportunity to to be a bit contemplative and to think actually what you do want to do with the rest of your life, and 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 the things that you in, that you miss doing, and the things that you absolutely don't miss doing. And the waste of time of all this traveling around to sometimes to give a talk somewhere, you know, it can take 24 hours out of your day and all you do is one little talk, you know, so it's great. For people. Yeah. I'm lucky. I'm very lucky. I appreciate it. And I've ma managed to keep out of the way. And, and because I didn't spend any money on fuel, I don't mind spending money in my Michelin star pub next door and buying delicious things to eat. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 so in terms of in terms of that side of things you know i i i, I can see why you'd find it uh pleasant um in terms of work do you not miss the travel aspect at all or, or is that rather a bore if you're kind of doing you know as you say only a 20 minute talk and you've got to travel around a lot 
was it more thrilling earlier when you first started traveling? Um, I, I think, of course, if, for example, I was going to go to Palm Beach and then go on to New York and to San Francisco and give those talks live. And that was, I was rather looking forward to that because I've never been to Palm Beach. And I was thinking, you know, to go to San Francisco, which I have been to, would, would be very good fun. But to be absolutely honest with you, the, the fee would have been eaten up in incidental expenses along the way. That's for sure. So, so this yeah. time, I'm actually not spending any money traveling. I mean, even if they paid for, you know, some of my travel and things, you know, you, you're bound to run up a lot of expenses. And so it would have been a nice experience. But I think um, I would recommend every young person to travel very extensively as quickly as possible. And then when the time comes, you never know when it could be that you cannot travel anymore, or indeed you don't want to. Um, if you're reading a book, and your character in the book goes down the Grand Canal in Venice, if you've done it, you don't have to do it again. You, you can visualize all that. If they're walking on the Great Wall of China, you know, you've got to do it once, but you don't have to do it the whole time. And so I think it's really good to see the world because then you have things that you can relate to. And then after mm. that, you can kind of travel without moving, I suppose. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> that does make a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, I'm currently in the process of, uh, you know, not right right now, but uh, as as the vaccinations hopefully roll out and travel becomes more popular, uh, more possible rather, uh, yeah. you know, it would be good to to finish off seeing seeing the world. I I think that that really hits the nail on the head. What what you've said there about trying to see it quite quickly when you're young, when you've still got that appetite, because it becomes less and less possible with kids and things like that for children. It does also, you never know when when any particular country is going to be impossible to go to for political reasons, you know, that mm. sort of thing. So, so if you have the opportunity, I, w I think it's really good to take it. And, you know, when you're really young, you, you know, a little bit of discomfort. I don't actually, I don't mind discomfort now, but, but, but you're better at it when you're young somehow, I think, too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think it probably becomes a bit of a drag. Certainly a lot of people who have to travel a lot for work, you know, touring musicians and such who come on here, they sort of say, oh, the gigs are great, the concerts are great. The travel is a real bore. Um, yeah. So, so I, w I want to turn our attentions now to uh, the the royal family. But first of all, I want to ask because you have been, uh, by all accounts, an extraordinarily uh, prolific uh, writer and a royal biographer, and uh, you know, writer about the royal family. Um, how did you first start getting? getting into this uh, uh, and uh, you know I'd love to hear more about about your your career to start with and, and well you know, what uh, made you so passionate absolutely well I was brought up in 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 London and apparently uh, we used to come to this very house for the for weekends and once apparently I burst into, into tears as a little kid and it was when when pressed as to why I was so upset I said it's because I won't be seeing the lifeguards again until next week you know because they used to ride through Hyde Park well they still do uh, perhaps not at the moment but they mm. normally they do and um, and then my mother took me to see the state visit of the Shah of Iran Shah of Persia and I enjoyed that so much that I asked to be taken out of school to see the state visit of President de Gaulle and so I saw these great processions in the Mall, and I got into all that and I did see the Queen going by in a car once or twice in London. I um, remember down Beecham Place of all places, which I, which wasn't the sort of place you'd expect to see her, but anyway, she did go along there on one occasion. And I mean, maybe she goes there often, but anyway, I remember seeing her then. And then I, to be absolutely honest with you, I started, like a lot of people, collecting press cuttings and you know cutting out pictures and sticking them in albums. So I would say that my interest was very much of the, what you might call the train spotting or stamp collecting uh, kind of interest and um, was very, very lucky to have one of those headmasters who was very, very knowledgeable about lots of things. And he, well, we had one of those Easter's at school and he took a group of us in our last term at prep school to St. George's Chapel for St. Matthew Passion actually. And while we were waiting in the queue, he, he talked a little bit about St. George's Chapel and I thought, gosh, that's the place for me. And I was very lucky because then I went to, I got in off the general list to Eton College, which of course is just over the, the bridge from Windsor. And on my first Saturday, I went up and I paid my shilling and I went in, I explored the place and I got to know it. And then eventually, well, I mean, I was only 14 or 15, I became a chapel guide on Sunday afternoons. You know how grim school is at boarding school on a Sunday afternoon, if you, unless mm. you're sort of to mechanics or something specific. And so I did, um, 
I did, I, I used to go up there and show tourists around, which just possibly was my first, you know, training about communicating with people and giving lectures later on, I don't know, it may have been. And so as time went on, I, I, I you know, I wrote various things and, and luckily it, it, this interest got harnessed at some point and, you know, all these things are very, very gradual, but um, when Princess Anne got engaged to Mark Phillips in, in 1973, um, all the people who had the information about who Mark Phillips was, unfortunately for them, had disappeared at places where the media couldn't get them and they left it all with me and I had to go on the radio and talk about it and things. I was only 21 and so that was my sort of trial by fire. And, um, and then I suppose gradually, you know, I did a few interviews here and there and I wasn't totally useless and so I, I, it all got harnessed. And then I wrote um, my, uh, my first real biography was of a woman called Gladys Deacon, who was a, um, a Duchess of Marlborough. And I'd read about her in the diaries of Chips Channon and a, a very strange account of her um, going into a jewellery shop and he didn't know who this strange creature was and whether it was a man or a woman. He went up, to, up and tried to talk to him, her, and um, discovered it was the, du the Duchess, but she denied who she was and stormed out of the shop. And then he, he reminisced in his diaries and he said, imagine she was once the world's most beautiful woman and, and how D'Annunzio had fainted when he saw her, such was her beauty and how she was the love of Proust and Anatole France and things. And I went to the school library and looked them up and I became obsessed by her and she disappeared totally out of view but she seemed possibly to still be alive. And to cut an extremely long story short, I found her when I was 23 and she was 94 and she was in a psychiatric hospital, which is why of course she disappeared. And I went to talk to her for two years and um, no, she hadn't really talked to anyone for about 15 years before and read, read that book and, and, and it came out. And uh, then Cecil Beaton asked, read the book and he asked me to be his biographer. So I did those sort of books first and then rather resisted doing a royal book until a little bit later on. And then um, one day, um, Prince Philip's private secretary rang up and said, would you like to uh, contemplate doing a book about his mother? And my first thought was, who's going to read that book? And my second thought was, that is ridiculous. This is what you've always wanted to do. And so I, um, I, I, I went off to do, to do that, which was lovely because it was also, I was helped a lot, you know. I, I, I could go and talk to... Prince Philip and Prince Charles and Princess Anne and, and various other people and work in libraries and things. And they gave me a very, very free hand. And that book, um, curiously, because of that wretched series, The Crown, in which she is a character, <laughs> um, it came out 20 years ago. It suddenly sold 3,000 copies in America recently. So people, you know, the one good wow. thing about the TV programs is that people are interested. They want to know more about the person. Um, but hers was an extraordinary story. Um, well, anyway, I mean, she was uh, kind of dressed as a nun and she hid a Jewish family in Athens during the war. She was a very saintly figure, had a very difficult life. And uh, it uh, explains Prince Philip quite a lot, of course, what happened with his parents. So that was great. And then I wrote a book about the Queen Mother and I've, I've written, I've edited a book about Queen Mary and various other things. Yeah, that's been, that's how it all got started. You mentioned The Crown uh, and you've written a book called The Crown Dissected, season one, two and three. Uh, so yeah. uh, you described it as wretched. So therefore, do, are you not a fan of the show? Uh, and um, if so, why are you not a fan of the show? Well, what I have to say about that show is that if, uh, one of its big problems is the fact that it's extremely lavishly produced, beautifully acted with excellent actors, with a good script and well-written. The reason that I don't like it is because it portrays real people in unreal situations, and it doesn't, uh, it's fundamentally very dishonest. It uh, twists the story around. And if you, I've, I've also done um, privately season four, by the way, so I've, I've, I've taken uh, literally 40 episodes apart forensically to explain where they go wrong and what the filmmakers are trying to do. And, uh, and um, so I, I can't help feeling that at the end of the day, they're trying to make you really rather dislike the royal family. Uh, they mm. certainly, one of their themes is that the, that the monarchy has got to survive at all costs and anyone who gets uh, steps out of line must be crushed and destroyed. And so they kind of rather celebrate the Duke of Windsor, which is kind of amusing. And then they, uh, they 
very much on the sort of lines of Princess Margaret was her life was ruined because she was forced not to marry Group Captain Townsend, which is actually not true. It was her, her decision. And you can imagine what happens with Diana. I mean, it's entirely um, Prince Charles is this evil, evil, wicked, also wimpy figure that they portray him. And she is, you know, this um, lovely saint, which, of course, is a view that a lot of people have, have taken anyway. But there are actually two sides to the story, inevitably. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the case in life. Um, I think a lot of people do take the crown with a pinch of salt, though. So, I mean, do you think that perhaps perhaps the problem that you're referring to as well, it could, it ju could just be what's the point in making it a bit fictitious? If it is going to be about characters that are still alive, why not just, you know, the story is pretty good as it is, the real life story, the things that happened. That's Why true. do you think they know the extent to which they're twisting it? And do you think that there's a kind of agenda there? Or is it just an innocent way of making it a bit more salacious for the for the for the viewers? Well, I think you see, somebody like you, you, Tom, would be an intelligent viewer, and you could you you could understand that it probably didn't actually happen like that, and, and you could enjoy it as a sort of a, a drama, which you know, it's very uh, it's very um convincing in so many ways but what I did like is that I see what's happening behind the scenes you know I'd see this thing I mean just you know just to give you one example and this is not specifically against the royal family but there's a scene at the end of season four where Jeffrey hired the chance of the exchequer uh, as he was I think at that point anyway he he make he lumbers out of bed he goes to the house of commons and he delivers his sorry he wasn't the chance of the exchequer he was the he was the the um the, the foreign secretary, I think. Anyway, he, he was a government minister and he, he resigns. And yes, we remember that. We remember Mrs. Thatcher sitting at the front bench looking distraught. And we, rem we know that the ministers all came in to see her and said, yes, Prime Minister, of course I'll support you, but there are some rumblings on the back benches. Uh, fine. And we know that Dennis Thatcher also said to her, listen, the game is up. In, in, in The Crown, he describes the, all the cabinet ministers as sort of murderers and bastards. Well, fine, you know, that's all fine. And then suddenly it goes completely off beam. And Mrs. Thatcher says in a kind of Gillian Anderson monotone, I have one card up my sleeve. I'm going to go and see the Queen and ask her to dissolve Parliament um, in order to save her skin, call a general election. Well, she never did that. Why on earth did they have to put that in? That's what's <laughs> so annoying. So, so history examiners, you know, ought to have a little actually ought to have my little book beside them so that they can see where they're mm. to, getting all this rubbish from. And that's just by no means the worst example. You know, they blame Prince Philip for the death of his sister. They claim that because he was mobbing around at Gordonston, his sister was killed in an air crash and that his, his father actually says to him, it's because of you, boy, that we're burying my favourite child. It's an absolutely monstrous accusation to make. And there are many more. And so, but do you think that they're doing it with a malice? Are they doing it, you know, the Thatcher example, is it because they are, you know, keen to, despite Netflix being a big, big corporation, uh, you know, who benefit very much from capitalism, they want to sort of play into this new, uh, it's not even new. I mean, there's been a lot of anti-Thatcher sentiment for a while, but I think it's very trendy now for companies to sort of be pseudo left wing. So, yeah. uh, so is it because of that or is it just innocent? No, I think obviously they're trying to make good drama and it's, it's much enjoyed by people. But um, I do think that there's an anti-monarchy anti, uh, um, agenda in it because uh, particularly the early episodes, Claire Foy was very brilliant as the Queen, actually. She got her timing, her theatrical timing extremely well. And she was very attractive and she was very... Uh, alluring. So I thought what they were doing there was let's make the Queen look fantastic and then all the rest of them make them look like like idiots and badly behaved idiots at that. But then they had Olivia Coleman. And the thing about Olivia Coleman is, of course, she's a very good actress, but she has a rather cheeky smile. And so in order to disguise this, she's always looking incredibly glum. And I reckon you'd rather dislike the Queen if you only knew her as portrayed by Olivia Coleman. Mm. I'm not alone in thinking, by the way. And um, no, it's 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 definitely it's definitely dangerous. I mean, Peter Morgan says that he sometimes had to conflate incidents and events, but he said we must never get away from the truth. But actually, he gets away from the truth the whole time. And, and his um, his advisor Robert Lacey has a come up with an extraordinary uh, theory that there is what he calls the truth, and then there is what he calls the emotional truth, which seems to me that if you don't like the truth, you kind of like invent 
what you would like the truth to be. And that's what the crown does. Mm, well, this, this actually thinks, like, plays very nicely into, uh, you know, talking about that interview is uh, rather irritatingly, some people like to refer to the Harry and Meghan uh, sit down with Oprah Winfrey as because this is kind of being referred to as uh, their truth, as if truth isn't this sort of objective thing. It's, you know, I can have my truth. Well, you know, uh, that just is total nonsense. If we could all have our truths, my truth would be that in fact, I'm a world-class footballer and an excellent pop star. Uh, and that I'm not taking anti-balding medication. But uh, sadly, uh, none of those three things are true. So, uh, you know, I don't understand. Where did we start? Um, where did we start just coming up with this new term, like uh, my truth? And, uh, and, you know, and then secondly, just your initial um, reaction. Were you a fan, as much of a fan of uh, the sit down with Oprah as television as you are of The Crown? <laughs> uh, yeah, yes. Um, well, uh, the, the, of course, you won't be surprised to hear that, that there's a lot of um, things about my truth and sort of uh, the, the language which is spoken by Meghan Markle um, is kind of like rather alien to me. And of course, I, I'm afraid that even before the interview, my impression was that Prince Harry was something of a captive and that he ought to be wearing an orange hostage suit, such as you unfortunately see on the television sometimes, because you know, there's a sort of a gun somewhere in the corner telling him what to say. And if I'm allowed to say it, he seems to be spouting a lot of kind of rather Californian rubbish as far as I'm concerned. But then, you know, listen, I would say that, wouldn't I? Um, no, I didn't like the interview. I thought it was monstrous. I think that when Meghan Markle first appeared, I watched her in suits. I studied her quite closely. I thought she was very uh, attractive and had a lot to offer. I, I went around saying, hang on, she's the first... Um, first royal bride ever to have addressed the United Nations. I, I very much appreciated what appeared to be her devotion to the Commonwealth because she was traveling for charitable causes in those African countries. And Prince Harry, I've seen him when, but when he was still with us over here, um, you know, in, I, I, I've seen him in places like Antigua and Barbados and things, I've watched him. Uh, he's very, very good with the kids. He plays cricket with them, he, he relates to them. You know, he's informal. His Invictus Games initiative, fantastic, and then his army career also was good. You know, he was very, he's very happy in that. And of course, I think it's what was extraordinary, um, that popular wedding. I mean, I was in Windsor that day, and I mean, the crowds and the enthusiasm for that young couple was massive. And suddenly, very quickly, between May 2018 and September 2019, apparently it had all gone wrong. And my, my suspicions were raised originally when I heard these rumours about staff not being able to be kept an endless turnover of secretaries and people like that. Because, you know, if you can't work with people, that's usually a very, very bad sign. And then because I do things at Windsor, I heard rather more, you know, about incidents that had happened with her being rude to the gardener and stuff like that. So this was a bad sign. And then when the baby was being born, I'm not an obstetrician, um, Tom, uh, as I'm sure you realise, but I'd ne never heard of a baby being born and then the mother subsequently going into labour afterwards. It's usually the other way around, isn't it? But that's what appeared to happen. That's what we were told. We were given confusing information. And then we weren't allowed to be told who the godparents were. Actually, I couldn't care less who the godparents are, but I immediately got rather annoyed because I feel there is always a deal that you have to make with the general public. We didn't want to interfere with the day of the christening. We just wanted to share it all, you know, as members of the general public from afar. So she was clearly trouble, you know, and, and, and she's been trouble ever since. And then, of course, off they go. And then, well, you know the story. I mean, they, they decide to, they go to move off to Canada and they settle in California. And then I begin to start unpicking it all. And I realized she dumped her father. She dumped her first husband. She dumped her Canadian chef lover. In Canada, she dumped Jessica Mulroney. In the Oprah Winfrey interview, in my opinion, she also dumped the whole of the royal family. And I rather wouldn't like to be too certain how long she'll hang on to Prince Harry. She'll hang on to him for quite a long time at the moment because he's her ticket to these Netflix deals and so forth. But there'll come a time when she won't need him anymore. He'll be rather difficult to market after a while, I suspect. And as for the interview itself, I don't mind people promoting themselves. You know, the, the Queen was very generous to them. She said, you know, off you go, give it a try. She left the door wide open for them to come back a year later. They, they didn't do so. 
um, if they go into the if the royal family go into the commercial arena and the political arena, that's very serious. So you know, if Harry and Meghan want to go into that arena, fine, but they must therefore distance themselves from the royal family, and they mustn't use their in my view, they mustn't use these titles because it's all, there's a lot of hi, I'm Harry, hi, I'm Meghan. But if you listen to the end of their podcast, it's thanks to the Duke and Duchess of Sussex for their contribution, you know. So they are using the title. I mean, we wouldn't be talking about her, to be honest, if she wasn't married to Prince Harry, would we? No, no. I thought so, Suits, uh, I, I mean, I thought Suits, uh, I'm not trying to be unkind. I thought Suits was bang average. Uh, it was just forgettable, forgettable stuff that I watched when I was hung over at university. I'm not going to rewatch it. Probably in 20 years, no one, no one would be talking for it if it wasn't for this. Uh, uh, suits suits was, was, was very much that, actually. You're quite right. Uh, but what happened was, it was a, as you know, it was a legal thing. And so let's say it lasted for 45 minutes. For the first 42 minutes, there was an insoluble legal problem. And in the last three minutes, extraordinarily, it got solved. And then you went on to another episode where exactly the same thing happened. Hmm. She was attractive in it. You know, she was... Uh, she, she was great. Like, she was oh. fine. She got a lot further in her life than most people who are criticizing her, for sure. It's not That's an anti Megan thing, but so no. uh, one thing that I, uh, trying to put myself in the shoes of the people who are, you know, because people have picked a side, either they hated the interview and they think it was, you know, ghastly, or they uh, loved the interview oh. and the truth, uh, their truth uh, being revealed. And so one thing that I'm kind of keen to get to the bottom of is why does anyone think it was a good idea or necessary if this is such a serious problem that, that um, you know, Megan was feeling suicidal and, and that there's a flagrant racism in the royal family? Why was it a good idea to, to do this kind of counseling session with Oprah Winfrey in public? Well, it wasn't a good idea at all. But what I think was what I think she she has always been going for, and that's why I'm a little bit worried about the whole marrying Prince Harry thing and then taking him away, isolating him from his family and friends and army and work, is that she is seeking what she's now got, which is global recognition. And Oprah is a stepping stone to that path. And what I think I really can't forgive her for was that she did mislead us in certain facts. She she misled us about the title of the baby, Archie, and about the security issue. And she linked those two things to say that the reason he didn't get a title of prince and, and security um, was because there was worry about the color of his skin. And that was outrageous because that actually pointed a finger specifically at the royal family and the royal household. But what she achieved, which I think is also unfortunate, is a huge sort of um, racial dissent debate generally all over the place. Uh, the mental health thing is another of these toxic subjects which you can't discuss because, you know, um, everybody has to be very careful about that sort of thing. And, and you know, when she said she, I know it was designed for an American audience, she said she went to human resources, look, you or I, and let, 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 no, let me put it like this, let's suppose that you were, uh, uh, you got a, you were, you came from somewhere like like Lithuania, and you got a job as a cleaner at Buckingham Palace, and you were hoovering the basement, and you got you had an issue. You go to Human Resources, and they will help you. That's what they're there for. But Meghan Markle doesn't have to go to Human Resources. She can pick up the telephone to any number of people. I mean, Prince Harry is involved in mental health charities. What's he doing? Why is he helping her? And also, you know, she did say this suicidal thing. I have to be terribly careful what I say because I'll be accused of everything under the sun. But I don't know psychologically there are there's a lot of postnatal gloom and dreadful things happen after babies are born but many mothers don't normally contemplate suicide when they're pregnant because they would therefore be killing their unborn child so you know i'm not so sure about that yeah i, I don't understand why people would have said no and also why would you go to hr if you, you would, know this isn't uh, this isn't uh, this isn't ernst and young and even if you did work at a firm you know, when they keep referring to it as a firm, sure, there's a firm, I'm sure, but it, it, it's, it's, it doesn't kind of make sense. It's almost like this, it's like referring to it as a company, but then I'm having mental health problems and I can't ring up Prince Harry. I can't ring up, Ed, I've got no one. No, really? Exactly. And the, the thing is that, you know, I don't think we would have minded her promoting her causes in conversation with Oprah, but she didn't do that at all. She wasn't given that opportunity at all. The only things that happened was she was slagging off basically the royal family and yeah. taking on them. That's and what it seemed like. 
she didn't ask any difficult questions about her relationship with her father or why she left her first husband or, you know, imagine what Jeremy Paxman or somebody like that would have done. That's what a lot of people have been saying to me, that, that uh, Paxman would have been ideal, but what a woeful interviewer. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's literally just uh, uh, the mind boggles as to how someone, I mean, she's obviously incredibly astute and successful and uh, intelligent in many other ways, myriad ways. But it, in terms of this interview, you know, there's an accusation of racism. Who said it? When did they say it? Why did they say, say it? What's did the they... point of the interview? Well, I know exactly. Well, it's it to air all these things, and it was all very staged and rehearsed, wasn't it? I mean, it was. She is an actress, remember? She knows how to deliver her lines. And then when Prince Harry came along, he sort of, kind of, actually uh, contradicted one or two things. And and I, I think you know what you know what I'm thinking. I write these books called The Crown Dissected. I, I think um, I think Oprah Winfrey interview that dissected might have to happen. That uh, would be great. Cool. That would be but great. I um, will go through it line by line. Um, how, how, how many times have you, have you had to uh, kind of give people the lowdown on this interview so far? Quite a few times, um, but, uh, but I hate to tell you that on, I'm not a great one for believing that the BBC is very left-wing, etc. but Nick Robinson on the Today Show cut me off. Um, uh, Jeremy Vine, they cut me off. And then when I said, look, hang on, that person, the other person's just got a fact absolutely wrong. Can I correct it? And the, the guy said... Uh, uh, no, 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 I'm afraid not. Come on the show another time and do that. Goodbye. And off I went. And then when I did the moral maze, again, at the end, they normally sum up each of the people. and They just didn't mention me at all um, because they didn't like what I'm saying. No, quite a lot I was asked to do it. But once again, the thing about the, the, the joy of this conversation is we can have a chat. But as you know, with the media, they really only let you say what they want you to say. They edit out what they don't want you to say. So that's well, why. Yeah, but I don't understand why. Why? Just, it just keeps coming back to why. Why should we respect people who throw their whole family under the bus? I mean, I have to say that the, I don't want to touch uh, the Meghan Markle, um, you know, mental health issue with a barge pole almost because, you know, I'll take what she says at face value. Uh, but at the end of the day, I'm very happy to, to, to sort of say, like, Prince Harry, what, why are you throwing your whole family under the bus on Oprah Winfrey? It's just, and why is our society, what, how has our society grown to the point where we're just sort of acting like this is such a wonderful thing? Most people my age kind of think that this is a marvelous endeavor. What's it achieving for anyone? It, it isn't achieving anything. And I think it'll be very interesting to see what happens in the long run, because as you well know, most times when people give royal, these royal, members of the royal family give these interviews, Prince Charles with Jonathan Dimbleby, the Princess of Wales with Martin Bashir, Prince Andrew with Emily Maitlis, and this, they all rebound on the person in the end. And I have, I have a, a very strong suspicion that as time goes on, this, the, this will rebound on them very badly. Not least because actually they, they had two hours to throw out a lot of information and people like me can then sit down quietly and just pick away at it and just explain to the world you know that actually what they're saying is is nonsense and so um you know they take her passport away and yet she travels sort of 13 times i mean you know she goes to new york for a very expensive baby shower i mean she has to have a passport to do that she tells us that she got married secretly by the archbishop of canterbury in the garden i believe i think today this this has been um knocked through. I mean, we haven't heard from the, unless something's happened today, which I've missed, we haven't heard from the Archbishop of Canterbury. He seems to have taken the telephone off the hook at Lambeth Palace, but <laughs> he ought to come forward and say, actually, no, I was just rehearsing with her, or, or we were just doing some vows, or we were doing one of those little garden scenes. You know, it all sounds nice, but it's actually, and so once you discover that she's telling you uh, falsehoods all the way, she's the one perpetuating falsehoods, not the royal family. And I also yeah. thought the Queen was incredibly clever the way she replied, because she didn't want to have a tabloid war. The tabloids must have been so disappointed. They weren't going to have angry palace slams, Meghan Markle, you know. That it'll be discussed privately. And I hope in those private conversations that they can ask them some extremely searching questions, like who said this? When did they say it? What on earth do you mean by that? And why are you doing it on Oprah Winfrey? Why are you doing it on Oprah? We know why they're doing it on Oprah Winfrey, actually. And it's as simple as that. It's just she, is, she has now become... I mean, her star has risen globally on account of doing it with Oprah, because Oprah Winfrey would agree with 
agree with me that she's probably the most famous interviewer in the world. You know, she's not the best interviewer, but she's certainly probably the most famous, certainly the most well paid. Yeah, so, well, it was it was. I mean, aside that, from the fact that you knew that that uh, there would be some interesting conversations, but they're very depressing conversations. Um, so I, I feel like, in the interests of of having a balanced discussion, I want to bring up uh, briefly uh, Prince Andrew. Uh, that interview with Emily Maitlis was just. For, in my eyes and for everybody's eyes, it was such a car crash, you know, oh, I'm too honorable to, I was so honorable that I had to be friends with Jeffrey Epstein and the Pizza Express stuff. I mean, you know, it sort of produced this avalanche of memes and, and whenever anybody makes quite rational arguments for why Meghan Markle's behavior and Prince Harry's behavior is a little bit questionable, um, you then, you will then have the very understandable comeback. Yeah, but the royal family is, crooked and corrupt and you know prince andrew is a pedophile so what do you make of that whole situation well i couldn't agree with you more that he was most unwise to give that interview um and um i suppose that he 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 isn't um the most severe liberal of people in the world but um some of the things were crazy i mean he was very very badly advised and he was very unlike Meghan markle he was very under rehearsed because you know there, there, there are things he could have said perhaps which might have been a little bit more convincing. The only thing I would say is I'll tell you exactly really what's going on with Prince Andrew is that Prince Andrew, you, you mentioned that thing about his loyalty. And his loyalty may very well be misplaced, but he's always been extremely good to his ex-wife, Sarah Ferguson. And she uh, runs up huge, huge bills and debts and things all over the place. And he is forever trying to sort her out. And that's why he has these dodgy friends. And you can be fairly certain that Epstein was one of them. I was bankrolling quite a lot of things that were going on. And um, uh, um, as you also know, you know, they got divorced, but they're kind of like always around each other. I, 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 I said that they actually, that, that couple has absolutely no respect for the institution of divorce whatsoever. <laughs> I mean, they more or less live together. And, uh, you know, people keep saying they might remarry. So, you know, so the thing is that that, that, my main accusation to Prince Andrew was, in a, in a way, is that he has dodgy friends, and actually the royal family shouldn't have, dodgy, shouldn't have dodgy friends. They've got to be careful. But that's the reason for it. As to him being a paedophile, I don't know whether he's a paedophile or not. I suspect he is not a paedophile. And I suspect even if he, even if he had a, some kind of a relationship with a particular girl who's accusing him, um, you know, she, she was of a certain age. I mean, listen, that's not what I call a paedophile. I mean, I'm, I don't want to be... You know, um, uh, no, I know. Do I? If she was seventeen years old, it, it sounds like a not a good. It sounds like a dodgy circumstance for him to be involved in. It sounds yes. like the interview was ill-advised. But in in England, you know, the age of consent is sixteen, and allegedly, yes, allegedly she was seventeen. Was, that's so, the point I was trying trying to make. But the point is also, Prince Andrew hasn't been convicted of anything, and it's, we don't know. People keep saying, "Oh, he won't cooperate." Uh, presumably, he has been advised by lawyers not to go to America because presumably they would like immediately arrest him and put mm. him in prison to discuss things with him. So he's not going to do that. But also the other thing I will say in his favor is that when, after this interview, when he was asked to step down, he stepped down immediately. We haven't had a squeak out of him since. What is unfortunate for him is that I don't really see how he can come back. I don't, I don't think anyone wants him. You know, he isn't, wouldn't be of, um, he wouldn't be beneficial to a charity, which a lot of the other members of the royal family are. He, you know, you wouldn't want him fundraising for you. Um, you know, and he's also, he's a sad character because he hasn't really made any good friends. And of course, as so often, you know, when somebody's in trouble, any kind of surly behavior, any disagreeable things that they've done in the past, this all comes out. But, um, you know, he's in a terrible situation now. He's sort of stuck there. You know, he can't yeah, there's no comeback for him now, yeah. and it's it, it, yeah, it's it. It must be it must be really. But he's yeah, been terrible. Very he's been very depressed for a long time because these accusations about him have been floating about, as you know, for many many years before they came to came to a head in the interview. I mean, I don't know if he hadn't given the interview, whether you know he would still be taking part in royal affairs and things, and still be he doing. Probably would be. It was a very bad decision. Um, yeah. In terms of, uh, you know, I, I, could, I could discuss some of these things uh, with, with you all day. Sadly, I'm running out, out of time. And so I feel like I need to boil it 
it down to one question, which is how does the queen keep things together from here on in? Uh, and, if, and if they come back uh, to England, you know, uh, is that likely? Wouldn't it be just so awkward? If, I mean, if I was, you know, my grandma wouldn't be letting me in if I did that. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I don't think she'll come back. He may do, he may, he may be sent back at some stage. Um, if you wanted to find a good sort of like epitaph name like Alfred the Great for the Queen, the one you could apply to her is Elizabeth the Steadfast. And you know, she has been through some bad times in the past with her family, and she's just had such a clear vision of what it is to be our Queen, that she has just gone straight on forward and keep, keep on with the job and keep on doing things the way she's doing them. And usually, in fact, always in the past that has paid off. And what I could say to you is that I think this year, uh, 2021 might still be quite difficult for people getting out and about. I mean, there will, the doors will open, I'm sure, but people will be a bit cautious. But next year will be the 70th anniversary of her reign, her platinum jubilee. And jubilees, I've been, I've worked very closely on all the last three of them, right back to 77, 2002, 2012. It's a fantastic opportunity to celebrate the Queen and for everybody to have a lot of fun for people to get things done during that year. If you want to build a village hall, call it the Jubilee Hall and you'll get it built. You know, and all those things happen. It'll be very positive. So, um, you know, just um, think back to this conversation in about um, sort of like a year, and a, a year and a half's time and see, see how things look then. I suspect they'll look very different. This episode is brought to you by Tingly. Tingly is on a mission to change the culture of gifting by encouraging everyone to give experiences rather than material things. Tingley's passionate team has handpicked the world's best experiences, including travel, adventure, romance, food, wine, and more, and brought them all together in one place. Tingley gives the recipient of the experience freedom of choice. Here's how it works. You purchase a gift box, Tingley sends an e-voucher or delivers a plastic free gift box, and the recipient chooses from hundreds of experiences in over a hundred different countries. There's no expiry date on any of Tingley's gift experiences. Tingley encourages us to give stories, not stuff, to treasure memories above possessions. To find out more, go to tingley.com. If you're enjoying the Greatest Music of All Time podcast, you can keep up to date with all of our latest episodes for free by subscribing. If you're watching on YouTube, the subscribe button is located at the top of the Tom Cridlin YouTube page. It's also at the bottom right of any video that you watch on YouTube. If you're listening on an audio platform, such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe at the top of the page.